Stop me if you've heard this one before. Brilliant college kids are inventing the future. Heedless of boundaries and possessed of new technology, they build a new company from scratch. Their early success allows them to raise money and bring an amazing new product to market. They hire their friends, assemble a superstar team, and dare the world to stop them. Ten years and several startups ago, that was me, building my first company. I particularly remember a moment from back then, the moment I realized my company was going to fail. My co-founder and I were at our wits' end. The dot-com bubble had burst, and we'd spent all our money. We tried desperately to raise more capital, but we couldn't. We were arguing in the street, and we couldn't even agree on where to walk next. So we parted in anger, headed in opposite directions. The company limped along for months afterward, but our situation was hopeless. At the time, it seemed we were doing everything right. We had a great product, a brilliant team, amazing technology, and the right idea at the right time. And we really were onto something. We were building a way for college kids to create online profiles for the purpose of sharing. With employers. Oops. But despite a promising idea, we were nonetheless doomed from day one because we didn't know the process we would need to use to turn our product insights into a great company. If you've never experienced a failure like this, it's hard to describe the feeling. It's as if the world were falling out from under you. Hard work and perseverance don't lead to success. Even worse, the many promises you've made to employees, friends, and family are not going to come true. Everyone who thought you were foolish for stepping out on your own will be proven right. It wasn't supposed to turn out that way. In magazines and blogs, we hear the mantra of the successful entrepreneurs. Through determination, brilliance, great timing, and above all, a great product, you too can achieve fame and fortune. But I've come to believe that story is false, the product of selection bias and after-the-fact rationalization. In fact, having worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs, I've seen firsthand how often a promising start leads to failure. The grim reality is that most startups fail. Most new products aren't successful. Most new ventures don't live up to their potential. Yet the story of perseverance, creative genius, and hard work persists. I think there's something deeply appealing about this modern-day rags-to-riches story. It makes success seem inevitable if you just have the right stuff. It means that the mundane details, the boring stuff, the small individual choices don't matter. If we build it, they will come. When we fail, as so many of us do, we have a ready-made excuse. We didn't have the right stuff. We weren't visionary enough, or we weren't in the right place at the right time. After 10 years as an entrepreneur, I came to reject that line of thinking. I've learned from both my successes and failures that it's the boring stuff that matters the most. Startup success isn't a consequence of good genes or being in the right place at the right time. Startup success can be engineered by following the right process, which means it can be learned, which means it can be taught. Entrepreneurship is a kind of management. We have wildly divergent associations with these two words, entrepreneurship and management. Lately, it seems that one is cool, innovative, and exciting, and the other is dull, serious, and bland. It's time to look past these preconceptions. Let me tell you another story. It's 2004, and a group of founders have just started a new company. Their previous company had failed very publicly. Their credibility is at an all-time low. They have a huge vision, to change the way people communicate by using a new technology called avatars. The engineering challenge before them is immense. I'm in this second story, too. I'm a co-founder of this company, which is called IMVU. At this point in our careers, my co-founders and I are determined to make new mistakes. We do everything wrong. Instead of spending years perfecting our technology, we build a minimum viable product, an early product that is terrible, full of bugs. Then we ship it to customers way before it's ready, and we charge money for it. We change the product constantly, much too fast by traditional standards, shipping new versions of our product dozens of times every single day. We really did have customers in those early days, true visionary early adopters, and we often talked to them and asked for their feedback. But we didn't do what they said. We viewed their input as only one source of information about our product and overall vision. In fact, we were much more likely to run experiments on our customers than to cater to their whims. Traditional business thinking says this approach shouldn't work, but it does, and you don't have to take my word for it. As you'll see, the approach we pioneered at IMVU has become the basis for a new movement of entrepreneurs around the world. It builds on many previous management and product development ideas, including lean manufacturing, design thinking, customer development, and agile development. It represents a new approach to creating continuous innovation. It's called the Lean Startup. There are five principles to the Lean Startup. Entrepreneurs are everywhere. You don't have to work in a garage to be in a startup. The concept of entrepreneurship includes anyone who works within my definition of a startup, a human institution designed to create new products and services under conditions of extreme uncertainty. That means entrepreneurs are everywhere, and the Lean Startup approach can work in any size company, even a very large enterprise 
in any sector or industry. Entrepreneurship is management. A startup is an institution, not just a product, and so it requires a new kind of management specifically geared to its context of extreme uncertainty. It's managed through a unit of progress called validated learning. Startups exist not just to make stuff, make money, or even serve customers. They exist to learn how to build a sustainable business. This learning can be validated scientifically by running frequent experiments that allow entrepreneurs to test each element of their vision. We do this by running through the build, measure, learn feedback loop. The fundamental activity of a startup is to turn ideas into products, measure how customers respond, and then learn whether to pivot or persevere. All successful startup processes should be geared to accelerate that feedback loop. This measurement is called innovation accounting. To improve entrepreneurial outcomes and hold innovators accountable, we need to focus on the boring stuff, how to measure progress, how to set up milestones, and how to prioritize work. This requires a new kind of accounting designed for startups. It may seem counterintuitive to think that something as disruptive, innovative, and chaotic as a startup can be managed, or to be accurate, must be managed. Most people think of process and management as boring and dull, whereas startups are dynamic and exciting. But what is actually exciting is to see startups succeed and change the world. The passion, energy, and vision that people bring to these new ventures are resources too precious to waste. We can and must do better. This book is about how.